Welcome to Knowledge Finder. Today we have a special guest, Donald Brown, the award-winning sculptor, the GB athlete, and the founder of the Millennial Monument Movement. Welcome, Donald. How's it going? Thank you very much for having me. It's going very well indeed. Thank you. So today we would like to talk to you a bit about your career journey, about what, your, what you do, your achievements, and also some other things like representation across different industries. Okay. So let's start with your career because you've had a very interesting career. If, um, not many would just sit there and decide, oh, I want to be a sculptor and become an athlete as well. So that in itself is interesting. So if you could start from the very beginning and tell us how that all happened. Well, I think from early on, um, I've often heard this saying, which goes, jack of all trades and masters of none. Yeah. And I've never really bought into that. I really believe from an early age that you can master many trades. Yeah. And so I didn't want to be limited by what other people thought I should do. You know, um, I started sculpting around about the age of 11, 10, 11. Yeah. And many people were saying, you could become a very good teacher. And although that was appealing to a point, I wanted more than that. And so I pursued art um, through my teenage years. I was featured on national television at the age of 14. If you can imagine <laughs> a young um, milk bottle glasses, massive F afro, nobody really paying attention to me in school. I was pretty much in the sidelines. Plus, I suffered from asthma and bronchitis. So I really didn't really mix or was able to play with the, many of the young children there. Yeah. Then one day I created uh, a sculpture out of wood. I actually took it home. I shouldn't have taken it home, but I did. But I worked on it feverishly, brought it back to school. And I was quite nervous because I thought the teacher might sort of tell me off. Bottom line was the teachers loved it. All of a sudden, all of the, the girls and the guys wanted to see who Donald, who's Donald, <laughs> what's he done? And all of a sudden, yeah. my self-esteem just blossomed. OK. And whereas I was in the shadows for so long, all of a sudden, it was great to feel I'm good at something. So I thought, well, I don't want to lose this feeling. So I knew from a very early age, I wanted to pursue sculpture, mm -hmm. even though my mother wanted me to be a church minister. <laughs> so she was disappointed. But long story short, um, to bring it forward many years, um, I ended up being featured on many TV shows in America and so forth. And one particular show was satellite linked to, I think, 177 countries and over 100 million viewers. And even though my mother doesn't watch television, members of the church went to my mom and said, Mrs. Dabro, I'm going to see you some on TV. What? <laughs> I'm doing a wonderful job with, it, with this sport, sport charring, sport charring. They couldn't even say the word. It's yeah. hilarious. And then my mom realized I was actually reaching a global audience with my ministry through art. Yeah. Because what I do with my artwork is I address real life issues. Yeah. How to promote respect, discipline, patience, humility, forgiveness. How do we address bullying and violence? And yeah. so within the sort of the construct and design of my art, I try to have a, a vision and a ministry that can m empower and hopefully elevate all people. Ah, that's great. So let's talk about the discipline side of things and you promote that within your art, but you have to be very disciplined yourself to actually achieve these things. So firstly, to become as good as you are at, at sculpting, how many hours did it take? Uh, what was your formula? Did, did you do it every day? Did you spend a certain amount of hours per day? It varied. One of the words that I've grown very attached to is the word organic. And the reason I say organic is because there is no real structure. It develops organically. For example, I was working on a, a sculpture of my bust, um, head and shoulders, when I was about 14 years old. And I remember I was on the kitchen table, and it was late in the evening. And I remember my mother saying, good night, Dana. I said, good night, mom. My brother said, good night. My dad said, good night. And then it seemed like five minutes later, good morning, Dana. What are you doing? I literally sculpted all night long. Yeah. So in terms of when you talk about discipline, because it was such a joy and a passion, it wasn't work. It wasn't even about I've got to do 10 hours today or five hours today. I would start a sculpture and really get absorbed into it. And it was very therapeutic and cathartic. And so that in and of itself was very good for me as a person to grow and yeah. discover that not only am I good at something, but I can spend hours doing it which allows me to develop my skill and get better and so forth. And so as I did particular sculptures, the time would, would vary, but the discipline was always there in terms of once I started, I was going to finish it. OK. And what about with your competing? How did you get into that? And That's a great question. You know, 
I keep referring to my mom because she plays a, a significant role. Around about the age of, I think, 16, 17-ish, I was invited to compete for Great Britain as a triple jumper. Yeah. And uh, I was so excited because it was a 90,000-seat stadium. Not that it would have been full, but it was like the biggest thing for me at that age. And so when I told my mother I'd been invited by my club, which is Wolverhampton and Bilston, she said no. Mm -hmm. I was devastated. Because to me, that was like a, a breakthrough. Yeah. And long story short, um, because of church, she didn't want to allow, she wouldn't allow me to compete. And so I... Why, may I ask? What's... Because our, the competitions were on the day we were going to church. Okay. okay. So for her, for, it was a question of either worship or competing. And so she wouldn't allow me to compete, basically. Yeah. So that burst my bubble in terms of training to become maybe an Olympian. And I was told by the late Charles Taylor, who coached many Olympians, that he could coach me to a level of world-class standard. Yeah. But unfortunately, as I said, I never pursued it because of what, you know, my mom didn't really want me to. So I became pretty much the general dog's body. I would do league meetings and whatever events you wanted to do, like pole vault or 1500 and 100 meters. I was doing all sorts. And so yeah. I just basically did it for points. I see. Then um, later on, I, <laughs> I went to America for two weeks. Stayed there for 10 years. I was, that's really my breakthrough. I was touring with my artwork, meeting celebrities, being invited to red carpet events, being on TV, in Essence magazine, all, all kinds of wonderful media exposure. Yeah. And over there, I discovered master's athletics. And I'd been out of my athletics for over, well over a decade, 14 years or so. Mm -hmm. And so I decided, I, I was playing volleyball at the time, so I was in decent shape. Yeah. And... I heard that there was a Masters National uh, Heptathlon Championship, which was seven events over um, two days. Yeah. So I thought, oh, well, give it a try and see how I'd do it. I won the gold medal. Yeah. I thought, oh, this is sweet. Just giving it a try. Just giving it a it. try. Okay. Uh, I became national champion. And then a few weeks later was the Pentathlon, which is five events in one day. And I competed in that, won the gold medal again. And I thought, I'm going to get back into my athletics but okay. as a master's athlete. Yeah. And so when I returned back to England, I returned back as a decathlete and won gold medals um, in that event yeah. uh, for, I think, two, three years in a row. And then at one of the European championships, one of my friends, Dalton Powell, said, Donald, the times that you're running for the 100 meters mm -hmm. in the decathlon, that's comparative to what the pure sprinters are doing. So I decided at the Europeans to... Um, do both. I did a, a pentathlon and I won the bronze medal in the pentathlon. And then I had to go at the 60 meter sprint. Mm -hmm. And I won the silver medal two one hundredths of a second behind Dalton. Okay. So then I decided I'm going to switch from training for 10 events to get one medal and train for individual events. And that's pretty much how I moved back into athletics and into the individual events. And as of 2019, I became the world champion at the age of 50, oh, 56, I think I was, um, in the 60 meter hurdles. Yeah. Uh, ranked number one in the world in the 100 meters and the 200 meters and the 100 meter hurdles. And I was voted uh, European, triple, Euro, triple European sprint male hat athlete of the year. Sorry, I won three gold medals at the triple European championships and I was nominated as sp European sprint athlete of the year. Wow, wicked. Well done. Myself. <laughs> too many achievements, too many accomplishments and medals. Um, so how do you actually train for um, each event then? Do you wake up in the morning? How do you start your day for on a training day? Well, I train with a squad of other Masters athletes and they're absolutely brilliant. Uh, yeah. Spearheaded by uh, Leon Braithwaite, who is a form, he's also a Masters athlete, brilliant, and also a former international footballer. And so I have a, a great squad that I train with. But I've been prepared for many years by an absolute phenomenal coach by the name of Joseph Keynes, who, if you're in the athlete world, you'll, you'll know he's, he's an icon. He, he, you know, Linford Christie sort of a, a looks up to him and admires him and the, the likes of. And so Joseph Keynes was really yeah. a great sort of foundation for me as an individual, as a young man, uh, as an athlete in terms of preparing me. Because he didn't just train me as an athlete. He trained me spiritually, mentally, emotionally as well. So in the mornings when I wake up, you know, Pretty much when I'm not lazy, I stretch and the usual stuff. But I coach pretty, I train pretty much on a Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday with the squad. Yeah. And really just rely on my current coach, uh, Leon, to give us the, the, the schedules that we need. And we, we try not to um, wimp out or, <laughs> you know, become yeah. too um, sort of uh, 
um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I guess frightened by by some of his sessions, but it's a great it's a great relationship we have with him, and also okay. training with the squad, They're tremendous guys. So you would say your coaches and your mentors, that's what really helps you. Oh, absolutely. Train. I think it's important to have people within your inner circle that you can rely on, which is one of the things I talk about in my sculptures. Be careful who you have in your inner circle. Not everyone who calls you friend needs to be in your inner circle. Yeah. And so I'm very selective with who I have within that particular circle because they can either drain you yeah. or they can fuel you. So when and did you learn that? I learned it through experiences by letting in too many people too close to me too soon and realizing that, you know, wolves do come in sheep's clothing and being burnt and being taken advantage of and naturally then distancing myself from those individuals and realizing these are lessons to be learned and also to be shared. I'm with you. Yeah, definitely, I agree. Um, so next, I would like to ask you about your artwork and in particular, the representation um, that you put in your pieces. There was one piece that I did really like and it was a lady that was lifting up the world on one side and then the man was like kind of dragging, dragging right. her up as well. Could you explain that a bit more for us? Well, please? that's the piece that will be at the forefront of the Millennium Monument movement. It's called the Millennium Monument. And yes, it features a man that's striding across the world. It pays homage to the African man and the contributions he's made to the world uh, in terms of elevating it to, to, to greater heights. Yeah. But with that particular sculpture, whereas you might think it is the man that's raising the world, when you turn it around, you realize it's actually the woman carrying the weight of the world on her back. So the message there is to pay tribute to the people, people of the African diaspora, the contributions that have and continue to be made, and to get this knowledge out to present and future generations. Because we live in a world where many people think, you know, what we have now came as a result of those who are here now. Yeah. But we stand on the shoulders that have gone on before, those who have gone on before. Not just our particular uh, culture or the Africans, from many nationalities. But unfortunately, we as Africans from the African diaspora, we tend to be um, ignored. We tend to have very little said about the truth of our history, our inventors, our creators, our contributors. Um, and when you do the research, which is something I'm very, very excited about with Knowledge Finder, is that here is a synergy where if a platform can be created, as you're doing, whereby people can go and find out, oh, oh, I didn't know that. The first black female millionaire was a black woman? Oh, really? George Washington Carver invented or created or developed and discovered all of this through peanuts? Uh, the person that created the blood transfusion was... was, was and it's all of these light bulbs that hopefully yeah. you will begin to turn on with Knowledge Finder because there is so much, even I'm still discovering in terms of what I didn't realize and why I didn't know. And I think what very often happens is that there's a certain narrative that is presented that we're indoctrinated from a young age that gives us the perceived notion or understanding that we didn't really play much of a role yeah. in building empires. I don't know about you, but when I grew up, when I was growing up, the books I read were all Peter and Jane, Peter and Jane. You know, the one book I had at home was The Three Gollywogs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah we, we, we laugh now, but at the time, that's a form of indoctrination. Yeah. These black, wide-eyed, red-lipped Gollywogs and all these stories. And I, was, and I was excited reading it, but when I went to school, it's Peter and Jane, Peter and Jane, saving the world and so forth. And yeah. so as I grew, and even in the media, when I see a lot of these movies that are done, you know, the heroes are usually white, you yeah. know, um, the roles that we, we're usually the first ones to get shot and killed off and so forth. <laughs> yeah. But I think people are waking up to realizing that. And what's great now with this whole um, Black Lives Matter movement, the protests and monuments being torn down, the Confederate statues and so forth, different nationalities are waking up and realizing, you know what, we did play a significant role in the building of empires around the world. And thankfully, generations coming through now are realizing that that acknowledgement, that honor needs to be paid the tribute to. And so the Millennium Monument will be the flagship of the actual movement. And the objective of the Millennium Monument movement is to have 10-foot versions, bronze versions of the Millennium Monument 
unveiled in different countries around the world. Oh, that's amazing. I can't wait for it to happen. And Knowledge Finder is a part of the Millennial Monument Movement project. So you'll be seeing a few features on the channel um, of the artwork and Donald and different bits and pieces he's doing. With that project, um, how can people from the African diaspora really uplift Africa the way you are depicting in that image? How would you su suggest the average Joe could go about playing their part in uplifting Africa? Because I feel like young people have this notion of we're in the UK or we're in the US, so not everybody thinks about the connection, even the economic connection back to Africa and how that will affect future generations and who controls resources, etc. So how would you say uh, your regular guy um, from that, anywhere in the African diaspora, how can they help um, uplift Africa? That's a great question. And one thing I've realized is that people in general are busy. They've got to pay bills, they've got, you know, car notes, mortgage and so forth. And when I speak to many people, they want to get involved with projects like this. Yeah. But they've got their own, you know, obligations and agendas. And so the way the movement is developed and designed is the actual lithographic prints of the sculpture will be made available for people to purchase. And that will fund the casting, shipping and installation and unveiling of these monuments around the world. But the good thing with that is, and I'm glad you mentioned the economic aspect of it, a percentage of that revenue will go towards various other entities, such as land irrigation for clean water, um, affordable housing, um, educational equipment for schools in Africa and other countries as well. Um, and so what we're creating with this movement is an economic platform whereby we're not asking for donations. We're saying if you want to support this project, by all means, purchase the prints. That will make you a patron of this movement. Yeah. So you're part of that. So yeah. when we do send a thousand pounds worth of uh, medical equipment or educational equipment to schools in Africa, then the patrons get the credit. Yeah. We, you know, we're, we thank the patrons for being a part of this movement and making it a reality. Um, and there are many people that also want to get even more involved and there will be an opportunity to become affiliates. Yeah. An affiliate, basically, it's very simple, three R's. You register as an affiliate, you uh, retail, which is the purchase set of the prints, and you refer other people. And that will create an ongoing viral type effect to reach more and more people, to invite them to be part of the movement. But the thing with affiliates is there will be a commission structure designed. It's not a fortune, but it's designed in such a way that because of you referring other people, then we pay you a commission. And that can actually mount up quite significantly, um, depending on how many people are referred and so forth. So we're looking at it from different perspectives. We want the individual who simply wants to support, they buy the prints and have done with it. Yeah. And those who want to be more involved can become affiliates and refer and certainly earn a commission from that. And then we have organizations such as Knowledge Finder, whereby another percentage will be designated to fund and support what you're doing. And we have several organizations with great agendas such as yours that we're looking to support and bring on board as well. So what you will see is a plethora of different benefits, a plethora of different entities being supported through the movement and thereby taking it from just buying a set of prints and putting it on your wall into funding and financing a host of wonderful agendas. I'm with you. So what I like about this project is the representation piece. So these um, pieces will be unveiled all around the world. And we know in London and in every other European city, there's many pieces on um, the large buildings, et cetera, but there's never any black people, although all over Europe, black people built a lot of those buildings. So it would be great to see your pieces on some of these buildings and in some of these um, locations, these um, well-known locations, because I think representation, representation really does matter um, within media, within the workplace and across the board. So I would like to ask you a bit more about that. Sure. What's your take on how your represent how you're represented in the media affects you growing up as a black male? Great question. When I grew, as I was growing up, one of the things I constantly heard was, why do you want to be a sculptor? You know, there's no, and, I, and it's a good question because there weren't any black successful sculptors that I could identify with. Yeah. I knew I was good at it, 
But I couldn't look up and say, you know, they're, they're, that's a black Michelangelo or Rodin or Bernini yeah. that I could say as a black sculptor, I, would, I can aspire and identify with that person. And so for me, it is, as you've quite rightly said, it's important to have these images within the public space because yeah. I want present and future generations to look up and say, I can see myself in that. And not yeah. only can I see myself in that sculpture, the message and the meaning within it is important because what the message says is that we are as important as other nationalities and that we have contributed globally in countless ways for this world to be where it is. And so for me, the representation is absolutely imperative. A lot of our young people are growing up blind to certain truths. Yeah. And so I hope that my sculpture will open their eyes in that way. What would you say to a black male growing up today in terms of, he, he's a guy that can't see him rep himself represented, represented in any aspect, in, apart from sports or media. He can't see himself represented in, I don't know, tech, the workplace, etc. Mm -hmm. So he, and he has no mentors. What would you say to him? What I would say is to define, find your own identity. Don't look for others to define you. Yeah. We all have our own individual talents. I wrote a quote for one of my other sculptures, which was, is, um, don't take your talents to the grave. They were given to you for a reason. Yeah. And far too often, young men and women are looking for others for gifts and talents that they already have within themselves. Mm -hmm. And to say, well, if so-and-so is doing that, then maybe I should pursue that. Yeah. When in fact, they've been blessed with their own set of skills and talents. And so not to be discouraged, our young people shouldn't be discouraged if they don't see themselves represented. I didn't see myself represented as a sculptor. Yeah. But I went out in belief and identifying within myself that, you know what, even though I can't identify with someone else who's done it that's black, I'm going to go ahead and do it. I'm going to hopefully break the frontier. I'm going to be the first, certainly within Wolverhampton or maybe even England and so forth. And others have come through since. But for me, it's about not waiting for others to define you and realize the power to define yourself is within yourself, is within you. And so it's very easy to be discouraged. It's a great question that you ask because there are people, young people that I do meet and they say, Mr. Brown, you know, I don't know what I want to do or why I should pursue. I mean, and... A lot of the times, what they do, I was in America and giving a lecture to some students, and they said, Mr. Brown, you, you know, you're from England. How, how come you're on TV and magazines and we're artists over here? Not a very good accent, I know, but I'm trying. <laughs> um, how did you make it? Yeah. And I asked them a question, and I said, well, what is it that you're trying to achieve? And I listened to one after another after another, and what I heard was that they were chasing money. Yeah. And I said to them, don't chase money, chase success. Money will follow success. Yeah. And so back to your question, I think a lot of young men, young black men and women, they are looking to see what they can do to make money and negating the talents and skills that they have that can, in fact, be successful in ways that can generate revenue. So sometimes they get misguided in thinking, well, if it's I know, rap or sport or other things that others are succeeding in, mm -hmm. then they try to force themselves to fit. You know, they're a square plug in a round hole. Mm -hmm. And that's where the danger is. And if they don't fit, they give up. Yeah. And yeah. when they give up, what they've done is relinquished what's been given to them at birth, their birthright, their talent, their skills, their abilities to achieve in other areas. Yeah. If I'd listened to other people putting me as a square plug in a round hole, I probably would have been a teacher. I'm with you. And I probably wouldn't have been a very happy... I said to my teachers at school, who was brilliant, Mr. Pope, Jeff Pope, brilliant artist. I said, why are you teaching? Look at the sculptures that you're creating. Yeah. And then he didn't really have an answer until later on in life when I'd graduated and I went back and I always went back to my school. Mm -hmm. And he said, the difference between you and I, Donald, is that you have a business acumen about you. Yeah. And that really resonated with me because growing up, I've often been accused of being an American trapped in a British body, <laughs> okay. which was one of the reasons I went to America. And I effectively, once I, I blew up, I became very successful over in America. And the reason I came back after 10 years was basically to look after my parents, hence why I'm here now. But yeah. with regards to our young people, I think it's, it's so important and imperative that they find their own niche, their own identity, and make sure whatever hole they are, if they're square, 
that they find that square hole that they fit in and not to let others define them and use the creative ability within their minds to think, well, how can I overcome this obstacle? How can I overcome this hurdle? Rather than it just being a barrier and, I'm, and, and you stop. Because when you stop in your journey, in your race, so to speak, of life, you create your own finishing line. Yeah. And too often that happens and people give up and then they, they settle. I think and that's... then in settling, it's like, you know, well, uh, I remember when I was around about 30 years old, I spoke to a couple of my friends who had got married, had children, and, and I just wanted to know, so, you know, how's life? How's it going? You know, and, and the response I got from both of them, these two individuals particularly, they said, um, well, it's <laughs> from Wolverhampton. Well, it's, uh, it's all about the kids now, isn't it, really? My life's pretty much over. It's like, I've got to just, you know, I'm driving the buses now for the kids, make sure they got food on the table. And, and the level of uh, lack, should I say, of drive and passion for life. Yeah. They'd got to a point where, in my mind, they were already old. Yeah. Because for them, it was, they'd done what they're supposed to do, and now they've got the kids, so it's now... They're on the back burner, and it's all about just, you know... And, of course, children are important, but your life as well, you can do so much more after 30. And that's something I always talk about. I grew up guilty of thinking, once you get to 30, it's all over. Which yeah. part? I mean, you must be joking. <laughs> <laughs> that's when I've been thinking. It's just started. And I'm, and I'm still breaking new ground, and I'm loving it, you know. One of the things I will say about Masters Athletics, which is great, which I didn't expect, you compete against athletes five years in your range. So at the age of 50, how old am I, 57 now, I compete against 55, 6, 7, 8, 9 year old, 57, 9 year old, 59 59 year olds. And then you go to the next category. So the great thing with that is by the time I get to 59, I'll be a baby in the next, in the next age group. So I'll be the, yeah. the younger one in that. So you're, you're rebirthing yourself, so to speak. And all of a sudden, the age process doesn't become a, a, as big a factor. And so it's always important to find new ways to reinvent yourself, new passions to pursue. And, and that helps to keep you young. I'm with you. That's an amazing answer. There's a lot of jokes. I think I look good for 56. <laughs> Definitely look way 56. younger than 56. <laughs> how, how old do you feel? Oh, wow. That's a, I'd say late 30s. Yeah. I say like, and I tell you what's great as well. When when I go to the track, a friend of mine, TJ, um, an African name, Tamarin Tamarin Njay of I love that name. Um, he coaches a group um, of athletes, and one day he said to his students, "I was running around the track," and he said, "How old do you think that athlete is?" And they looked and they said, "Oh, early 30s." I was around about 52 at the time, and when he told them my age, they were shocked. Yeah. Because I was running faster than some of them, not all of them, some of them. Yeah. And, but what was great was when they realized my age, the level of respect I got from them, there were times I would just sit them down and just talk to them yeah. and counsel them, and they would listen. Because in their minds, in their eyes, TJ had told them, oh, I'm a world champion or international champion and so forth. And for them, sometimes they think, well, you know, to be a world champion, you can only do that when you're in your 20s. Yeah. And so that's a big responsibility for me to say to myself, right, I've achieved what I've achieved. And then the responsibility is on me, it's incumbent on me to share and impart what wisdom, knowledge and understanding I can to the next generation. And that's a way, in relay terms, of passing the baton on. Well, oh, definitely. I think that's a great philosophy. So, Donald, you mentioned um, the business acumen that made you different from your teacher. In the UK, um, why do you think there's such a lack of black-owned businesses? And when I say that, I mean major black-owned businesses, not um, like a, a barbershop or something like that. I mean corporate black-owned businesses. I think very often when black people come up with great, wonderful ideas for businesses, the danger is selling out. Yeah. And I've seen that happen quite often. And by that, I mean, for example, you've got a business and you built it and a corporate body might come to you and offer you a million, two million for it. And they're going to make 200, 300 million, if not more. And I think too often um, as black people, we are very quick to accept the million or two million or whatever is offered because it's significant. Yeah. And historically, we don't have that history of coming from old money, wealth. And so when the opportunity arises to get a piece of that pie, so to speak, the tendency can be to, well, I'll take that for now and I, you know, build from there or I'll be okay. Yeah. Rather than 
possibly struggling on for a little longer and maintaining control of that particular empire, so to speak, that, that future empire that could be yours. And then by doing so, we can control more. Okay, so how do you think that affects individuals growing up? Because I felt like when I was applying for various jobs, there, there weren't any black companies to apply for, for what, what I actually do. And that would pay the rate that I want for my salary. It, I mean, again, it is part, unfortunately, of our history and culture that not enough of those businesses have been set up. They are, they are coming through now, yeah. um, more so than in the past. But I think it is a case, again, of breaking frontiers and not accepting the fact that this is the way it has always been and therefore I will just go along with that. I go back again to the example of myself as a sculptor. You know, I could have accepted the fact that, well, there haven't been any other black sculptors, so yeah, I'll be a teacher. And I'm not to say that my life wouldn't have been successful in its own right, but I've achieved so much more. And I think that's an example of how we as black people, with our businesses and ideas and the acumen that we have, not to sell, sell ourselves out or sell, sell ourselves short, because there is so much potential that unfortunately is not realized because we sell out too soon. Okay, thank you. Do you have any advice for young entrepreneurs that would like to either start a business or even get into the art world? Treat your business like a child, like a baby. And the reason I say that is because too often, too many will share their dreams too soon. No woman would give birth to a child and suddenly just give it away for someone else to raise. Yeah. And so it is with business and using that analogy, too often when you have an idea and it's great and you share it with so many people, because they don't see life through your eyes, they don't have your vision for that particular goal and that dream, what they see are their obstacles, their limitations. What do you want to do that? You want to be a knowledge find? Who wants to find knowledge? What, no, for what? Yeah. But it's, it's already out there. I mean, yeah, it sounds good, but, you know, black people can find that information if they want to, if they really want to. And, and so what you find, you have a great idea, you're fired up and you're excited about it, and you're sharing it, and then all of a sudden you're getting sort of pulled down and sort of the, the comments that you're getting aren't uplifting and encouraging. And then very often what happens is those comments can come from your loved ones and families. And because you respect them, you might think, well... Maybe, 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 yeah. Okay, maybe I won't do it. Yeah. Because you respect them. And so that's why I say treat your ideas, your visions, your missions, your business concepts with kid gloves and protect them and develop them. Now, here's the thing. If you create an idea and it does not succeed and it fails, that's not necessarily a bad thing, provided you know why and you can learn from that. Yeah. And again, this is important to say because very often when we pursue visions and goals and ideas and dreams and we don't succeed, we just give up rather than looking as to why it failed. I bring that back to my athletics. If I'm running in a race and I perform poorly, rather than thinking, oh, give up, why did I fail? Did I drive out hard enough? Did I pop up too soon? Did I lift my knees high? What, what actually contributed to my failure or not performing as well? Yeah. And so I can apply that to real life. There are so many wonderful, incredible, creative individuals out there. But as soon as they give birth to an idea, they become vulnerable. And that's where you have to protect that sphere around you. And that's why I said before, it's important to select those around you who you call friends. Yeah. Not everyone who calls you friend needs to be in your inner circle. Not everyone who calls you friend you need to share your ideas with. Yeah. And be mindful of people who are jealous. Thank you very much. Would that be the main piece of advice then? Well, that is certainly part of it. I think the, the, the thing to do is to do your research. Probably a key piece of advice is this. Just because you have what you think is a great idea, do your due diligence. Yeah. Because we can be so creative, one day it's, oh, I want to be a knowledge finder. The next day it can be, I want to do bodybuilding. The next day it can be, I want to open a, ca a cafeteria. Yeah. And they're all great ideas. But if you don't do your due diligence, then you won't know what your competition is like. So you're steaming ahead, 100 miles an hour, 
with what you think is a great idea and you haven't done your due diligence and therefore when you wake up to reality you wonder why things begin to fall apart so yeah my my best piece of advice is or one of my key pieces of advice is to parents who say to their young children you can be anything you want to be and the reason i'm bringing this in now is because that message can transcend throughout the years into adulthood yeah and we can think we can do anything i have an issue with that statement you can be anything you want to be no you can't yeah i don't agree with that statement and i know parents say it with the best of intentions mm. tweak it slightly you can be anything that you have the potential to be yeah and the reason i say that is and i'll give a scenario here um, a child came home from school one day and his mother and father were watching tv and they were getting really excited because they turned the channel and it was a horse racing and they were getting excited yes come on come on yeah come on yeah oh, oh, yeah and they got and the child was watching the excitement and then he started watching it and I thought, oh, this is actually quite interesting. And then he got into it and then weeks went by and he was watching all the race and so forth. And he was now, you know what? He, Mom and dad said I can be anything I want to be. Yeah. And then he decided, you know what? Yeah, I believe them. I'm going to be, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a jockey. Yeah. I want to be a racing jockey. The child was 13 years old, six foot tall, 200 pounds. <laughs> well, because he'd been told you can be anything you want to be, yeah. the, the filters that needed to be in place weren't there. He yeah. just believed he can be anything he wanted to be. So back to your question about young entrepreneurs. You can achieve anything you want to be. You can pursue any business you want to achieve, but make sure, one, you do your due diligence and make sure you have the true, genuine potential to achieve it. Don't just achieve it or pursue it because it sounds great or you can make a lot of money. Yeah. Understand that if you don't have that God-given innate potential, then you could be chasing basically clouds and stars in the sky. And that's not to discourage people to pursue their dreams. Yeah. It's make sure that you do have the potential because otherwise you can spend a lot of time focusing in the wrong direction. And that to me is a very key piece of information that I think both young and old should embrace, internalize and personalize. No, thank you very much, Donald. No, I think that is great. I do think we have to channel our energy in the right way. Um, we can't just, I don't know, be a footballer and you haven't got the, exactly. you're, you're way past the, hey, like, I couldn't wake up today and say I'm going to be Ronaldo tomorrow. It's just, you've got to be realistic Absolutely. about your goals and what you can achieve. Um, so thank you very much for coming down and having a chat with us today. Um, I'm very sure the people at home will find some gems within this conversation. Um, do you, what, is there anything you want to close with in terms of your projects that's, that are coming out? Um, well, I would, yes, I would strongly encourage those of you that are, are watching that, Understand that even though the Millennium Monument movement is about primarily having the Millennium Monuments in different countries around the world and paying homage to the ancestors and remembering the millions that suffered in the transatlantic slave trade, what you're doing is also important. And by your listeners and viewers uh, aligning themselves and becoming affiliates and, and purchasing the prints, that will also generate revenue for Knowledge Finder which will be another benefit, which will, I'm sure, um, give the world a wealth of knowledge to sort of tap into. So this is not about Donald Brown or the Millennium Monument only. It's bigger than that. It's bigger than me. And it's about making sure that we can unite credible businesses such as yourself together and elevate and inspire and empower present and future generations. Well, thank you very much, Donald. And we would like to see the Millennium Monument on many buildings. As I said, there's a lot of these buildings in the UK and worldwide. We can change them a bit and put our Millennium Monument image on there. When you, If you take a look at the end of the video, you'll see um, the image. If you like it, purchase it, hang it up in your home. But to make real life, life-sized um, sculptures and actually put them in uh, influential places, popular places, it'll be great to see. And I think it's necessary. So look out for it. Knowledge Finder is supporting that. Let me also say that uh, for the viewers, again, once they do view the video and they wish to be a part of that, uh, you will have your own Knowledge Finder uh, unique link. 
and then that will be the gateway for everyone to go through and that will ensure and guarantee that funds are attributed in addition to everything else funds will be attributed specifically for knowledge finder to fund what you're doing as well so it's all structured in such a way that it's all automated and once you share your link with your audience then that is the link that they should then tap into get to the website see all the information see the video register uh, purchase their prints and become affiliates for those who want to become more involved and in so doing you not only support the millennium monument but we also support knowledge finder as well thank you very much so you heard it here guys donald brown knowledge finder and that is it we are out